Okay, welcome back everybody to uh, Shmuel Aleph. It's been a while. Um, so, uh, I don't suppose any of you can remember uh, anything about what we were doing. Stuart's shaking his head. No, nobody can remember where we were, what we were doing. Jeffrey remembers. Only because I've got the Tanakh open and I've got a bookmark in where David marries Michal and Jonathan makes peace between Saul and David. Okay, uh, so that's next week, that Jeff. We haven't quite got there yet. Okay. So let's have we've a little got recap. Four plots against David. Yeah, let's have a little recap of where we're up to because we are going to talk in some detail uh, over the next week or two about the relationship between David, Shaul, Jonathan, Michal, uh, and it's it's all a uh, um, a tangled web of uh, uh, interacting relationships, um, which, if we're honest, don't reflect well on very many people at all. Perhaps only Jonathan is the only is the one. Perhaps Michal as well, but Jonathan is the only one that really comes out of this looking uh, good, in my humble opinion. However. We will see where we get to. Let me just give you a summary of where we were up to, um, because it's important to get the background. Um, Shaul was made king, as we know. He uh, um, messed up, didn't do what he should have done with Agag. There's our connection uh, that we have to Purim uh, coming around the corner. Um, yesterday's Haftorah. I hope that yesterday, when you were following the Haftorah, you all recognised it uh, intimately. Uh, chapter 15 of uh, Shmuel Aleph, um, the story of Shmuel's uh, failure to kill uh, the King Agag, which we did uh, several months ago. Um, David was chosen by Kaddish Baruch Hu to be the king, was crowned in private, in a private ceremony with his family by Shmuel. Um, he, at the same time, became Shaul's harpist. Is it such a word, Michael? It's harpist. Mike, you're, you're, you're muted, Anita. Michael says there is a word, harpist. Okay, good. So David becomes harp, the harpist for Shaul. And at the same time, he also uh, um, does battle and gains victory against Goliath. Goliath. Important in that story uh, is that David, well, not just David, anybody who was going to battle Goliath and win was, pr was promised a reward by the king. We've mentioned many times that the king really should have been doing this battle with Goliath himself, King Shaul, but he uh, he bottled it and he didn't do it. So he said, anybody that will do this and will be uh, victorious against Goliath will have a reward. What was the reward that this person was to be given? His daughter, the princess. <laughs> His daughter and something else as well. And it's clothes. No. Nope. No. Nope. His family were to be um, exempt from royal service. And some opinions say that they were exempt, going to be exempt from taxes. But the main, you're right, the main reward was the king's daughter uh, in marriage. So David has, in fact, earned that reward, has he not? He has defeated Goliath. And he is entitled, therefore, to collect the reward of the king's daughter. And what happened was, and this is where we, we got to. Um, well, let's go and have a look. Uh, I'll put it on the screen for you and we'll just recap where we were holding. We're chapter 18 of Shmuel Aleph. There is the screen for you. Um, let's go to... Actually, we may need to go back to chapter 17, I suppose, just to look at this. 
Let's just go back for a minute to chapter 17. There's the, the battle. No. No, it must be in chapter 18. Let me go back to the beginning. There we go. There we go. Found it. Verse 17, Jeffrey, please. Chapter 18, verse 17. Paul said to David, here's my older daughter, Merab. I shall give her to you for a wife, but you must be a warrior for me and fight the wars of Hashem. Saul said to himself in brackets, let my hand not be against him. Let the hand of the Philistines be against him. Let's stop there. So, Shaul seemingly uh, begins to think about even fulfilling his pledge and giving Merab, the older daughter, to David as a wife. But he is not quite straightforward, Shaul, because... The deal was, whoever kills Goliath gets to marry the king's daughter. But now he's putting another condition on it, which wasn't there. He's adding another condition. He's gazumping David here and saying, well, OK, you can marry Merav, but you have to be a warrior for me and you have to go and wage the wars. That wasn't in the deal. And we're told, um, because we are privy to what Shaul says in brackets to himself that he actually wants to get rid of David because he sees David as a rival quite correctly uh, but he doesn't want to kill him himself let not my hand be upon him but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him so he says I'll give you my uh, my daughter in marriage but you have to go and be a warrior for me and his hope his hope is that David will be killed by the Philistines. Now, what does that tell us about Shaul? He wasn't a very nice fellow. He doesn't seem to be a very nice fellow. He seems to be wanting to get rid of David in an underhand manner. But more than that, even, Johnny, mm. what else does it tell us about Shaul? He's jealous. He's jealous, yes. What does it tell you about Shaul? Well, he's not a family orientated man. He's going to lose a son in law. Exactly. Exactly. Right, what does he tell you about his relationship with Merav, with his daughter? Yeah. He's yeah. going to give her a husband and then he wants to get her husband killed. So he wants to see his daughter a widow. Yeah. So what a terrible thing. So. Uh, I mean, we have to say that Shaul was ill at this stage, so we, we we have to be a little kind to him. He was schizophrenic, clearly. He was uh, His mind was disintegrating. Um, he was ill. Uh, and so we can therefore perhaps uh, allow him a little bit of leeway for his illness. But it doesn't look good. The optics, as they say, are not good. Yes, Anita? Dave, David uh, did exactly the same with Bathsheba's husband. He sent him off hoping he'd be get killed. He did the same thing. OK, we will come to that in due course. And that's why I said that nobody really comes out of this looking good apart from Jonathan. David doesn't look good either. And we'll yeah. before we even get to Bathsheba, we'll see something else. But yes, hold that thought about Bathsheba. You might have to hold it a little while because it will be a few weeks, I think, till we get to Bathsheba. But it's coming. We can't avoid Bathsheba in this whole scenario. So um, Shaul, um, as far as he's concerned, is willing to give David to Merav, his daughter, but he wants to get rid of him. He's reneged on the deal. He's underhandedly trying to get rid of David and doesn't seem to mind that his daughter is going to be a widow. Doesn't look great. Let's carry on. So. What does David say? I know we're going back over what we've already done, but it's important to set the scene because we've had so many weeks away. Uh, verse 18, Jeffrey. David said to Saul, 
Who am I and what is my life? Or my father's family in Israel, that I should become a son-in-law to the king. Stop there. So David says, I'm not worthy. Now, whether he really thought that he wasn't worthy or not, or he was just being, um, you know, when somebody offers you something and you really want it, you say, oh, no, 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 I, I, I couldn't. I couldn't. You know, you, you're eyeing up that cream cake on the table and somebody, it's the last one. And somebody said, go on, you have it. Oh, no, 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 I couldn't. Really, you want it. Uh, because, why do I say it? One sec, Jeff. Why do I say that? Because we'll see later on that when it comes to Michal, he wasn't quite so, uh, uh, he wasn't quite so modest to say that he, he wasn't fitting. Uh, and we'll see that in a minute. And there's a bit of a contrast. Maybe he just didn't fancy Merav. I don't know. Maybe she was a Mearskite. Who knows? But, but um, uh, David here says, no, thanks. I'm not worthy. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not worthy to be the king's son-in-law. So, um, so in verse 19, um, let's just see what happens. Then I'll come back to you, uh, uh, Jeffrey. Verse 19. But it happened that when the time came to give Merab, daughter of Saul, to David, she was given instead to Adriel, the Mahalathite, as a wife. So Shaul, as it were, uh, if we take our cream cake analogy, uh, right? David says, oh, no, 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 thanks. I couldn't. I, I really couldn't. So Shaul says, OK, I'll give the cream cake to somebody else. Um, uh, and he, he doesn't waste any time. Um, he doesn't try and persuade David to say, yes, I think you should be. You are worthy. David says, I'm not worthy. And Shaul says, all right, I'll give him somebody else. And she gets married to somebody else. OK, let's just stop there a second. De Jeffrey, you wanted to add something. Yeah, I just think it was a bit sly of David to say he wasn't, uh, who am I, what is my life, what's my father's family, Israel, come son-in-law to the king. He already had been anointed. <laughs> he knew where he was. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's a bit, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't ring true, does it? Well, it doesn't put him in a good light. No, and, and, what, and when you see what happens next with Michal, you'll see that that is, is, I think, is a correct interpretation. But let's go on, because yeah, now... Excuse me, Johnny, one, one second, at the bottom of the page, of Steinsel says, maybe it was possible that, what's the name? Uh, uh, Merav. Merav didn't fancy uh, David. And that's possibly true. What does he say here? It seems that Adriel was a notable figure in this city. Apparently, Merav was not interested in David. Yes. She may have already been acquainted with Adriel, and therefore the match was made despite Saul's unofficial offer of her hand in marriage to David. That's the Abarvanel's opinion. I don't know on, on what he bases that. I haven't looked at the Abarvanel, but I, I don't know what he bases it on because it, does, it doesn't seem to me to be based on the Psukim. Uh, the, that explanation of the Abarvanel, which says that you know, Merav did her own thing, would go very much against the, uh, uh, um, the, the the methods of the time where uh, it wasn't the dumb thing. Uh, we've all seen Fiddler on the Roof, haven't we? It wasn't the dumb thing for the daughter to go and choose their own uh, husband. Certainly not at the time of Shattle. Certainly not in the king's house. Um, um, I, I'm not convinced by that, Johnny. I don't know about everybody else thinks. Um, I think that Shattle... Um, um, Shaul chose not to give him to David, give her to David. I, I, I don't see any implication that Merav was given any choice in this matter. And you'll see as we go along, maybe later today, when we do a bit of comparison to a previous story in Tanakh, um, that the girls, the brides, do not seem to have much to say in the whole matter. What does anybody else think about what the Abarvanel uh, says? as quoted by Rav Steins out, that it was actually um, Shattle um, um, didn't really have a say in this, and Merav went off and found her own fella. Any comments? Anybody got anything, thoughts on that? What do you think, Johnny? Possible. Possible. <laughs> OK. Sorry, Dad, I don't like him, Dad. <laughs> I don't care what he's saying. <laughs> OK. Uh, you'll do as you're told. And marry yeah. him. 
Okay, interesting because I I thought the other way around. I thought, well, maybe David doesn't fancy Meraf, but there you go. Yeah, that's why I said it. It's yeah. Funny. All right. Can, um, can, I just ask, can I just ask you, Johnny? Do we know anything else about this guy Ad, Adriel? Because it specifically talks about him, um, names him, who he was. Maybe there was some other reason going on why that match was going to be a good match. Yeah. Well, this is what the Barvanel says, as quoted by Rush Steinzalt, that apparently. This Adriel was a notable figure in the city, so he was presumably an eligible fellow, which would fit with the fact that David says, "I am not worthy. Who am I? I'm just a, I'm just a little shepherd boy, and my family are, are, are nobodies." So Shaul says, as it were, "You're right. I'll give her to, I'll give her to a knacker." Adriel was a knacker. He was a notable. He was a, a some kind of aristocrat. You're right, David. You're not worthy. I'll give her to somebody else. So I think that that I think fits in quite well. So he's been practical as well. He's still had enough sense. He was still compassmentous enough to know what a good deal was. And, and perhaps, you know, and of course, with, with with the illness that that he had, there are times when he is rational and times when he is irrational. And we know that even without knowing any modern medicine, because the Torah tells us this spirit of Hashem comes upon him. Um, uh, and as, as uh, my wonderful uh, grandmother used to say, he got one on him. And, 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 and he would, right, Jeff? <laughs> he got one on him and he, would, uh, he went off on a, on a crazy. Um, but that wasn't like that all the time. He was at some point he was rational. So it may well be Avril that at this point he says, yeah, you know, that make, that's a better match than David. And, he, and David gave him the opportunity because David said, no, I'm not worthy. Whether he meant it or not, it's another, it's another story. OK, so now comes into the picture um, the younger sister. The younger sister. And I want you to start thinking about what that might remind you of because we're going to come back to it in a minute. Verse 20, Jeffrey, please. But Michal, daughter of Saul, loved David. They told this to Saul, and it was proper in his eyes, Saul thought. I'll give her to him, and she will be a snare to him. And the hand of the Philistines will act against him. So Saul said to David, through one of my two daughters, you will become my son-in-law today. Let's stop there. Now, I've just thought about this now, uh, having had that point, the Abarvanel pointed out. And I think that perhaps these psukim is what has encouraged the Abarvanel to say what he says, because it seems through verse 21 that Shaul was um, determined to have David as a son-in-law in order that he can send him out to battle with the Philistines. Now, on the one hand, why does he need to have him as a son-in-law? He's the king. He can do what he wants. He can send David off to be a general um, against the Philistines without him being a son-in-law. So that's a little bit difficult to understand from the first point. But on the other hand, the flip side of it is, if he is determined to have David as a son-in-law in order that the Philistines will kill him, and if Merav, as the Abarbanel has suggested, says, I'm not interested in David, don't fancy him, uh, and I'm not marrying him, then Michal comes along and says, well, I'll have him. Uh, uh, I, I like him. Uh, and Shal says, OK, that's all right then. Uh, and, and so maybe maybe that's what has encouraged the Abarbanel to think that Merav had a had a mind of her own and uh, and rejected David as a husband, possibly, because it seems that Shaul at this point was uh, set on David as a son in law, but only not because he liked him as a son in law, but only because he wanted one of his daughters to be a snare to him. So, again, it doesn't say much about Shaul's uh, um, feelings for Michal either, because now he wants her to be a widow. He's not really bothered whether either of them are widow, as long as one of them marries David and he gets killed. Yes, Geoffrey? Uh, but also, he'd also made a proclamation uh, earlier. Shaul had made a proclamation that uh, 
that uh, whoever um, um, a, a sl sl slew Goliath uh, doesn't have to serve the, the king anymore. That's true. That's true. The family didn't have to do royal service. That is true. And of course, he's reneging from that as well. Yeah. Because as we will see, um, we'll see what goes on now. Let's carry on and we'll see what, uh, first of all, Shaul, has, when, when he offered Merav, it came with strings attached. The strings attached were that he had to be a general in the army. He had to go and fight Shaul's battles. But now with Michal, we'll see those strings are fleshed out a bit and they are, they are um, um, made clearer what David has to do. Let's go on. Verse 20. Again, um, please. Okay. But Michal, daughter of Saul, loved David. They told this to Saul, and it was proper in his eyes. So Stop there, Jeffrey. Who loved whom? Michal loved David. Okay. David Who's... loved Jonathan. David loved Jonathan. Yes. Does David ever love Michal? Are we ever told? Well, you won't know because you haven't looked on yet. We haven't learned it. I will tell you. I'll let you into a little secret. David is never said to love Michal. Michal loves David, that is clear. But David, and we will see very, very clearly from his words, not that he necessarily doesn't love Michal, but that is certainly not specifically stated. And it seems to the reader, as we'll see in a minute, that David also has ulterior motives, uh, not as unpleasant ulterior motives as Shaul. Shaul wants David killed. Um, but let's see what goes on. So 21, Saul says, I'll give him to Michal. She will be the snare. I'll send him out to the Philistines and they will kill him. Verse 22. Saul then commanded his servants, speak to David in secret, saying, behold, the king desires you and all his servants like you. So become now the king's son-in-law. Stop there, Jeffrey. Stop there. Um, what do you notice about that verse that's a bit odd? There are two things that are a bit odd, I think, in that verse. Well, he's doing it indirectly, isn't he? Yeah, what's all that about? Why is he speak to David secretly through his servants? Why can't he speak to him himself? He's asked, he spoke to David directly when he offered Merav. Why is he not speaking directly when Michal is now interested? What is the difference? Any suggestions? I don't think David was too keen on the idea. Well, I think, I think, I think David, if I was David, right, um, and I'd been offered Merav, and then I'd said, I'm not worthy. And the king had said, you're right, you're not worthy. I'm giving her to Adriel. I don't think I'd believe him if he came to me and said, tell you what, I'll give you Michal. <laughs> right? I don't think I'd believe him. And I think that that's what Shaul thought. Shaul thought, if I go to him directly, he's going to turn around at me and say to me, well, you, 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 sort, of, you, you sort of did one over on me with Merav. Um, you said I wasn't worthy, or I said I wasn't worthy, and you agreed. All of a sudden, I'm worthy. What's going on? What's wrong with Michal? You know, there must be something wrong with her. Uh, if, 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 you know, I wasn't worthy for Merav, but I'm worthy for Michal. So I think that I think there's an, an element here that Shaul has, in a way, burnt his bridges a little bit on this issue. And so he's having to go through, you know, schmuckly channels. We're all used to that kind of thing, aren't we? Some more than others, uh, of, you know, doing things by the back door and, and schmuckles. It, it usually it usually, you know, falls flat and comes back to bite you on the backside. But this is what's going on here, I think. 
I think Shaul is commanding his servants, go and have a word in David's ear, saying, you know what? What the king did with Merav, he really does desire you as a son-in-law. He really does. And you know what? This is the, the second thing which I, I wanted to point out that I thought was strange. Um, look at the next bit. And all his servants love you. It doesn't say that the king loves you. If I wanted to persuade, um, if I was the king's servant and I wanted to persuade David that he was wanted, I would say, you know, the king really wants you and he loves you. But no, the servants love you. Never do we find that Shaul loves you. Well, David knows that Shaul doesn't love him. He's tried to throw a spear at him or, uh, and, and, and kill him directly uh, um, uh, on one occasion. And he's going to do it again uh, in the next chapter. So um, anyway, he says, the king desires you, um, desires you as a son-in-law. Doesn't mean he likes you, but he wants you as a son-in-law. Uh, but we know we, the reader, knows why we, he wants him as a son-in-law, so that he can get the Philistines to kill him, because he's a rival. So this is all very underhand, really, by Shaul. Um, and he gets his servants to do the dirty work. Um, and he says, the servants love you. Now you should become the king's son-in-law. OK, so verse 23, the servants do what they're told. You want me to read it? Yes, please. So the so Saul's servant spoke these words in David's ears. And David said, it's a trivial matter in your eyes to become a son-in-law to the king. I am a poor and simple person. Stop there. Let's have a look at the actual Hebrew words, because there's a little bit of a uh, play on words here. Verse 23. Vayedabru avdei Shaul boznei David. And the servants of Shaul spoke in the ears of David, et advarim ele, these words. Vayomer David. And David said, Can you see that word, hanakala, where my pointer is on the screen? What word can you see in the middle of that? Kala. Yes, but that's with a kaf. Jeff. No, cow. Cow. Cow, cow yes. Light. Cow with a cuff. What does cow mean? Light. Light. It was, um, it was one of the uh, very few Hebrew words that my father, Zichrona Livracha, knew. One of the very few modern Hebrew words that he knew. Why do you think he knew that? When he ordered a coffee. No. no. He was always, always on a diet. Um, right, yes. and he was he would go and look for the products in the supermarket when he was here in Israel that said Mishke Kal. Right? <laughs> Mishke Kal. If you're on a diet, that's what you've got to look for. Lightweight. Mishke is white. Uh, Mishke la, Mishkal Kal, but lightweight stuff. So, right. Kal <laughs> means light. Yes, Kal is light. The light railway, Rakevet Kala, the right the light uh, rail uh, thing. Cal means light. So David says, is this a light-hearted thing? Is it something, uh, um, uh, not a serious matter to become the, 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 the son-in-law's king? This is serious business, he says. Serious son-in-law. But he, and I, he says, um, ish rash v'nikle. I am poor. The nikle, can you see the same word? It's the oh. same word. I am a light person. I'm not a serious. I'm not a serious contender here. I'm a lightweight. I'm a lightweight. Um, but what he's stressing here, this is slightly different to what he said with Merav. With Merav, he said, I'm not worthy. Here, he says, I'm poor. I don't have the ability to give a dowry. Now, in the very beautiful book that David Marks gave me on Shmuel Aleph, um, there's a little section in there that talks, um, that talks about uh, marriage 
in the uh, in the uh, Near East at that time. It was often uh, and even much more uh, uh, um, recently connected with a dowry of some sort. The groom's family had to pay uh, the bride's family a price for the bride. You know, 10 camels or 20 uh, goats or whatever it was uh, that, that was the price that was set. What it appears from the uh, evidence, the archaeology evidence, is that it was usually financial and it was not usually, although there were exceptions, uh, what Shaul asked for. Now, Shaul uh, was the king. Presumably, he had uh, uh, all the king's taxes and what have you. So he wasn't short of a bob or two. And he does not ask David for a dowry. He asks David for something else. David says, I am too poor. I can't provide a dowry for the queen, for the, for the princess's hand in marriage. Well, the first problem about that is that he shouldn't need to pay, give any dowry. Why not? It'll be, it'll be given a present. Because he's already done what was asked of him. Yeah. He killed Goliath. So this is reward. He's earned this reward. He, 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 there is no need for him to provide a dowry. It's um, also the color. The color uh, side should always provide the dowry, not the uh, husband. Apparently not, according to oh. the. Uh, let me read you what it says in this uh, in this little bit here. Just get it open again. Uh, here we go. Um, dun, 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 dun. In the bride, it's, it's called customary. Bride Price, okay? Marriage was an important institution in the ancient Near East. Marriage is addressed in all surviving ancient Near East law collections, including those of Ur Nama, Lipit Ishtar, and a few other ones I've never heard of, all of which specify the conditions for payment of the bride price as part of the marriage contract. The household of the groom paid an amount usually set by the father of the bride in silver, animals or consumable goods to the household of the bride. In contrast to the usual practice, Shaul specifies his payment in dead Philistines, we'll come to that in a sec, who are distinguished from other people in the region by the fact that they are uncircumcised. Using foreskins to prove the number of enemies slain in battle recalls a similar act by the pharaoh Merempa, Merempta, I don't know, I've never known how to pronounce that, who stated that his troops collected phalli with foreskins from their defeated enemies in the Great Libyan War inscription at Karnak. So it seems that the, uh, uh, this was unusual, uh, what Shaul was uh, asking David to do, which we'll see in a minute. But the truth is, he had no right to ask him to do anything because he had already earned the right to marry the king's daughter by killing Goliath. So David says, I'm too poor. So verse 24, Jeffrey. Wakey, wakey. Saul's servant was told him saying, David spoke these words. Saul said, so shall you say to David, the king desires no diary, only 100 Philistine foreskins. <laughs> to avenge the enemies of the king. Saul intended to have David fall at the hands of the Philistines. So Saul is still not giving up, is he? He says, I don't need any money from you. It doesn't matter that you're poor. But the dowry that I want is a 100 Philistine foreskins. One wonders what he's going to do with them uh, when he's got them, to be honest. Um, it reminds me of a joke, which is probably not appropriate for, for this uh, forum. Anybody that wants to hear it, I'll tell it you uh, privately. Um, but anyway, he clearly doesn't really want the foreskins. He wants um, the dead Philistines. Uh, he, and, but he doesn't even really want the dead Philistines, does he? What he really wants is for the Philistines to kill David. Um, and we are uh, privy to that because the Navi tells us explicitly that, that, that this is what he wanted. The you think, do you think he wanted, excuse me, Johnny, do you think he wanted him to go out and do it all on, on his own or with the armies? Well, he doesn't say, but 
He yeah, killed Goliath, he's now gone and killed the little ones. <laughs> one assumes, one assumes that David would gather his troops yeah. uh, to do that. Um, we do, uh, however, um, have a precedent for one man going out and doing it on his own, don't we? Yes. Shimshon. Shimshon, correct. But I, I think, I think, I don't think that's the, the, the implication in. It may have been. But um, um, I, I think that David would have said, OK, um, I'll get my trusted uh, SAS and we'll go and uh, we'll go and we'll go and do the job. And um, what's what shall one? Just, I wanted to just show you this this uh, Hebrew here in verse 25. The Sha'ul Chashav, Sha'ul thought, Lahapil et David. What's the root of that word, lahapil? Le Nafal, to fall. Nafal, very good, Faye, to fall. Oh. Yes, no fail. Somebody who no fails, somebody who falls, okay? Uh, um, no fail means to fall. Now, what, what is the construct of that word, Faye? Lahapil is to make something else happen. Yes, it's a causative it's a, you're, construct. You're it is a causative construct. Ani no fail, I fall, but ani mapil, I cause to fall. Okay? It's a causative effect, a, a causative uh, construct. So Shaul thinks, I will cause David to fall. How? through the hands of the Philistines. So I just wanted to point out that very clear, uh, um, through the grammar, that very clear intention of Shaul is that he, Shaul, intends the fall of David only at arm's length through the Yada Plishtim. He's already tried to kill him himself. He's tried to throw a spear at him. Well, he did throw a spear at him. But he missed. So now he's down to do it indirectly through the Plishti. You can see what kind of deranged state that he's in here, uh, um, bearing in mind that he already knows from Shmuel Anavi that his kingdom is finished and it's going to be given to somebody else. He knows. No, he doesn't know. He suspects that David is that somebody else. What is he trying to do? He's trying to best HaKadosh Baruch Hu here. He, he knows what is going to happen. He's been told a nevuah. He's been told a nevuah. And this, by the way, takes us all the way back to the coronation of Sha'ol himself. Remember what happened at the coronation. He was crowned in private by Shmuel. And Shmuel says, go down the hill and three things will happen to you. He gave him a prophecy. And those three things happened. What was all that about? That was to prove Shmuel's credentials as a prophet of Hashem. So Shaul knows that Shmuel is a prophet of Hashem. Shmuel has said another prophecy. The prophecy is... God has torn away the kingdom from you, just as you have torn this garment. Remember when uh, Shaul tore the garment of Shmuel uh, after the Agag fiasco. So he's heard a prophecy from a man who he knows and has seen with his own eyes and heard with his own ears is a prophet. That, that he is going to lose the kingdom to somebody else. He pretty much knows that somebody else is David. And yet he's still trying to, as it were, outdo the prophet and, as it were, outdo a Kaddish Baruch Hu. It shows the nefilah, the fall, that same word, of Sha'ol from the potential that he had. He was head and shoulders above everybody else in appearance. And presumably he had, well, we know he was very modest at first, wasn't he? He ran away. He didn't even want to be, be crowned at first. He, he wasn't interested. He was, he was modest. 
all of that has gone out of the window. The modesty has not remained. In great contrast to whom? David. 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 Well, I'm, I'm not so sure about that, Faye. David's modesty doesn't, doesn't, um, doesn't last either. He behaves like a king as well. No, issuing yeah. edicts one point, after the other later on. I was thinking of Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe oh. Rabbeinu, he was the uh, humblest of all people. And he remained so all of his life, despite the fact that he was the leader and a, and a much more um, um, complete leader of all the people than Shaul ever was. Um, Shaul loses his modesty, loses his mind. Moshe Rabbeinu, in contrast, remains the humble servant of a God all the way through his 120 years of his life. So there's a contrast there. You can see Shaul um, is, is trying his damnedest here to fight HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And it's a, again, it, 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 it reflects very badly both spiritually and ethically against Shaul. Uh, and, and if you read Tanakh, if we read the uh, uh, Sefer Shmuel Aleph as we are, uh, there is no, there is no uh, um, room for, for misapprehension here. The, the Navi is not impressed with the life of Sha'ol, which begs the question as to why people call their child Sha'ol. And Sha'ol is, you know, you wouldn't call your child Pharaoh or Haman, uh, I'm not suggesting Shaul was in those categories, but he wasn't a great guy. I mean, I used to think that I wanted to, to if I had another child, which would be a miracle, uh, that it would be, uh, uh, I would call him Shimshon. But having learned Shimshon uh, in great detail, I no longer would want to call my child Shimshon, but I don't think he would particularly, uh, was a, a, a positive character. Uh, and I would say the same for Shaul. I don't think Shaul is 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 um, uh, uh, um, is shown in a very good light at all in the Navi. There's all, always Mepharshim who are willing to, to do the whitewash. You know, we'll come to it in due course where the, the Gemara itself says that anybody that says that David HaMelech sinned with Bathsheba is wrong. Uh, and uh, we're going to come to that, uh, notwithstanding the fact that David himself says I sinned, but that, that's not for today. Um, so... Um, anyway, I think I'm digressing a bit, but where are we up to? So, uh, Shimshon Osberg, the mole called Shimshon. He was, he yeah. was. Perhaps that was a uh, uh, that, that was he, took, he took four skins, yes, he did. That's <laughs> true. Uh, but and it's very interesting, you know, because the Gomorrah says, the Gomorrah said, I think it's, I think it's in a Gomorrah in Shabbos, but I could be mistaken. And the Gomorrah says that uh, a person is born with a certain character trait, both good and bad. And what one has to do is to uh, channel these character traits in the best way you can. So if you are a bloodthirsty person, the Gemara says, then instead of going out and killing people, you should become a shoichet or a moyel, uh, and then you will satisfy your desire for bloodshed in a positive way. That's what the Gemara says. I think it's the Gemara in Shabbat. Yeah. Um, and maybe Shimshon, who was named Shimshon, maybe that was his... Uh, uh, and, and he certainly channeled that whatever he had. He was a great shaykhet, uh, and he was a great moil. He was my moil. I don't know if it was yours, Johnny. No, Chaim Halpin, I think. Chaim Halpin was yours. Shimshon Olsberg was my moil. Uh, he did a decent job, as far as I can tell. Um, and uh, so, yeah, maybe that was uh, maybe that. Was that. So, <laughs> where are we up to? Uh, we still got a bit of time. So, um, we know here that um, Shaul now says, I'm not interested in your money. I want 100 Philistine foreskins in the hope that David will be killed by the Philistines. This is Shaul's intention. He does not want the foreskins of the Philistines. He wants David to fall by the hand of the Philistines. The, the pasuk is clear because the end of the pasuk here is connected to the beginning. Um, it's telling us what he wanted. He wanted le hapil, to cause the fall of David. Okay, now then, verse 26, Jeffrey. Verse 
His servants told these words to David, and the proposal was proper in David's eyes to become the king's son-in-law. The days had not yet expired. Okay, when let's David... stop there. Okay. Um, so David gets told this. Vayishar hadavar. David. What word can you see there? Vayishar. Yishai. Yes, Yishai, but that's, yes, Yishai, it was the father of David, but that wasn't, that's not got a race in it. Yishar is a remainder. Straight, a straight, straight. And narrow. Yes, Yashar, Yashar, straight. Emet v'yatsiv v'nachom v'yashar. Okay, Yashar means straight, upright, good. Um, David, of course, does not know that Saul's intention was to kill, have him killed by the Philistines. David has now gone 180 <coughs> degrees, hasn't he not? He's offered Merav. He says, no, 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 I'm not worthy. Maybe he didn't like her. Um, then he says, with Michal, I'm too poor. And the king says, I'm not interested in your money. Just go and get me 100 Philistine foreskins and you're in. Vayishar hadavar ve'enei David. And David thinks, okay, I'm up for that. That's a good thing. So David has now changed his whole philosophy, which makes me wonder, what I said right at the beginning, whether that was David being the cream cake. Uh, you know, say, oh, no, no, not really. I don't know. But anyway, at this point, David uh, is up for the job. And... Uh, you can see in verse 27, Johnny, the answer to your question. Jeffrey, yeah. verse 27. When David arose and went, he and his men, and slew 200 Philistine men, David brought their foreskins and sent them all to the king in order to be the king's son-in-law. Then Saul gave him his daughter, Michal, for a wife. Let's stop there. Yeah. That's the answer to your question, David. Yeah. Uh, Johnny, uh, David arose and he went with his men, Vuhuva and Ashav. So he didn't go on his own. He went with his, his men, as we suggested. Now, I just want to go back to verse 26, the end of the verse 26. Velo malu hayamim. And the days have not expired. Um, just a, 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 a linguistic thing, malu. What word can you say in there? Malay is full. Malay is full, correct. The days had not been fulfilled. In other words, the day that... What does that mean? Velo malu hayamim. Well, it was, it was probably in the afternoon. No, it doesn't say the day had not expired. The days, plural, hayamim. The days had not expired. What does that mean? So he had a few days to make up his mind. Well, it looks like... It looks like, although we're not told explicitly, it looks like Shaul has said, I want 100 Philistine foreskins and you've got a week to do it yeah. or a month to do it or whatever. Some kind of time scale was given to him. And the days that he was given to do the job had not yet expired. Um, and it's a bit strange that that little... Uh, part of the Pasuk, because we weren't told that he was given a time scale to do it in. Um, and so why are we being told that this time scale had not yet expired? And uh, I'm not going to tell you the answer to that, because that's going to be uh, something for next week. I'm going to give you some homework to do, and that's part of the homework. But just hold those words in your mind. This time scale these days had not expired for whatever that means okay now then verse 27 david arose and he went with his men and how many foreskins did he bring 200 why how many was he asked for 100 he brought double why to prove that i don't know he was a great soldier Uberschlag. He 
yeah, I wanted to, he wanted to hedge his bet. Make no, sure he, that, you know. He wants to overslog the king, right? You ask for 100, I'll bring you 200 to show what a big shot I am. Okay, now, who, who suffered at the hands of that? No. The Philistines. The hundred Philistines. The hundred Philistines. <laughs> Okay, well, you know, you can argue the Philistines were the were the enemies of David, and you know, all's fair in love and war and all that. Um, but and this is one of the criticisms we had of Shimshon was that he used his own personal vendettas, which was a, the vendetta against his father-in-law. Um, he took out his own personal vendettas. On all the people around, collective punishment. Um, he go. He went. What did he do? He set fire to all their fields with the the torches of the uh, what you call it of the foxes. He killed another few thousand with the jawbone of an ass. Why? Because his wife had dubbed the riddle into his father-in-law, and he he got cross. He used the concept of collective punishment or, or at least he used the enemy for his own personal gain and it seems to me that David has done the same here if he had gone out and got a hundred foreskins you could argue that that is what the king told him to do and so therefore he has to go and do it he's a, he's a, he's a soldier in the army of, of the king that's what he's got to do but he didn't he went out and he doubled what he had to do. He didn't have to do that. He could have just brought 100. He brought 200. And he didn't bring 200 because those 200 soldiers were threatening the kingdom. That's not what we're told. He brought 200 for his own personal aggrandizement. And I think, again, that reflects somewhat not well on David Hamelech. Uh, David, are you uh, going to jump in and uh, disagree with me? We can't hear you. You don't look to be muted, but we can't hear you for some reason. No, can't hear a word. It's, it's as if you're completely arc. muted. Maybe says, sign, sign out and sign in again, and we'll listen to Anita in the meantime. It says in the art scroll commentary, it showed that he brought he brought twice as many, showing that again Hashem was with David. All right, that's a typical art scroll. Thank you. Um, yeah. David, are you back? No, we can't hear you, David. So uh, Anita says that um, Anita says that uh, by the art scroll that this shows that Hashem was with David. Well, that's true. Hashem was with David, uh, but it was David's choice to take 200 uh, uh, Philistines instead of 100. The next uh, pasuk says that. The next pasuk says that. Twenty-eight. Twenty-eight. Yes. <clears throat> well, it says that. Yeah, the verse twenty-eight says that Saul uh, knew that Hashem was with David. That that's the point of verse twenty-eight. Let's just do verse twenty-eight now, Jeffrey. Saul saw and understood that Hashem was with David, and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him. Stop there. So Shaul has now got another, you know, another clap on his head, really, and piss him on him. You know, he's got a patch him on him there because he's seen, he tried to get David killed. And what happened? Hashem was with him. And not only does he bring him 100 foreskins, he brings him 200 foreskins. And that shows Shaul that he's in trouble here. He's fighting a losing battle. Hashem is with David. And also, Michal loved David. Does it say David loved Michal? No. No, it doesn't. Bear that in mind as we go along. We're going to just finish the uh, chapter. David, are you back with us? We've got some any sound on you yet, David? No, can't hear you. You'll have to write to us on a on a on WhatsApp to the to the group and tell us what you think because I'm interested. Um, okay, verse uh, twenty nine, Jeffrey. So Saul continued to fear David, 
even more, and Saul harbored enmity towards David all the days. Okay, let's just stop there. Vayosef Shaul, from Ta'ad, Musaf, yeah, Musaf is uh, the additional service, yeah, the same word, Vayosef Shaul, Shaul added on, Leiro Mipnei David, Od, he became much more afraid of David, quite right so, because he realized that God is on his side. Vayehi Shaul Oyev. What is the word Oyev? Enemy. An enemy. enemy. Yes, Oyev is an enemy. This is, on the, on the, on the screen it says hostile. What did you just say, Jeffrey? Um, enmity. Enmity. I think enmity is a better word because Oyev means an enemy. An enemy, if you have an enemy, you can be hostile to somebody without them necessarily being your enemy. Uh, to be an enemy, to, as I understand the word enemy anyway, it's something really, really deep and really, really um, fundamental to say that you're an enemy. Uh, and Shaul Oyev et David, he was his enemy all of his days. Now, um, Michal, on the other hand, loves David. What is the word for love? You've got it there on the last verse of the Pasuk here. That means she loved him. How do you say uh, love in the present tense? Ohev. Ohev. Does that sound like another word to you? Ohev. Look at the word in verse 29. Sha'ol oyev et David. Ohev and oyev. They have a similar sound to them. And it's right. potentially here that the Navi is using uh, a little bit of poetry. On the one hand, Sha'ol oyev et David. Sha'ol is the enemy of David. And his daughter, Michal, Ohev et David, or Ohevet, because she's a woman, uh, um, loves David. There's this onomatopoeic connection between uh, the two words, uh, which are uh, obviously opposites. David, uh, Shaul hates David and he's an enemy. Michal loves David. David expresses no emotions towards either of them. Doesn't say that David hates Shaul, and it doesn't say that David loves Michal. Okay, so uh, that's um, that's just something there, a little bit of language there. Let's just finish the last pasuk, and then I will tell you what we're going to do next week. The last pasuk, thirty. The officers of the Philistines would venture forth, and whenever they ventured forth, David was more successful and all the other servants of Saul, and his reputation became very outstanding. Okay, so what does that pasuk mean? What, what, in simple terms, what happened? Well, he was on a roll, wasn't he? <laughs> he yeah. The, the Philistines were... He was a were, winner. Were, the Philistines came out, which means that they would attempt, every now and again, they'd attempt a bit of a, an insurgency, I think that's the modern word for it, isn't it? Insurgency. Yeah. Um, uh, and each time they came out, who was it that knocked it on the head? David. David. Mm -hmm. And he was more successful, more successful than any of Saul's other servants. And his name became highly esteemed. And what do you think that did to Shaul? <laughs> Yeah, that would have really wound him up, wouldn't it? Uh, yes. uh, he's, yeah, I mean, this is such a brilliant story. It could be like, you know, it's, it's. I don't know if there's been a film made of this particular part of the Tanakh, but there should be. Here's Shaul trying to get rid of David. The more he tries to get rid of him, the more successful he is. And Shaul is just getting more and more and more wound up by the fact that everybody loves David, right? His name is highly esteemed. The servants love David. Verse, what is it there where the servants love David? 
Uh, here, verse 22, the servants love David. Verse 27, Michal loves David. Verse 30, David's name is highly esteemed. And all the while, Shaul is hating David. He must be cocking his head off there in the palace. <laughs> uh, and, and so we see what happens. We'll see what happens in the next chapter. Um, so uh, we'll stop there. Uh, and we will carry on next week. I want you to think for your homework for next week. We have seen a story here of David, Shaol, Merav, and Michal. And I want you to think back in Tanakh. And don't tell me now, but I want you to tell me at the beginning of next week what that where there is a parallel story in Tanakh, which parallels our chapter here. And then we will look at the comparison of the two stories uh, next week. OK, um, so let me just summarize what we've done today. Um, we we have shown the uh, offer of Merav as a, a wife for David, but it came with strings attached. He had to be a warrior. David says, I'm not worthy. Shaul says, all right, I'll give him to somebody else. Michal says, I'll have him. And she said, and Shaul says, OK, that's another way I can get rid of him. Send him out to battle with the Philistines. Uh, David says, I'm too poor. Shaul says, I don't want your money. I just want you to bring me 100 foreskins. David goes out and he brings 200 foreskins. And um, despite Shaul's best efforts, he does not get killed by the Philistines. Everybody loves him. Shaul is there. You imagine if you had a cartoon there, you'd have Shaul there pulling his hair out in the in the uh, in in the in the, um, uh, no. the palace, going ganache, ganache, ganache. What can I do to get rid of this David? Everybody loves David apart from Shaul, and that is where we will stop, and we'll look next week at the comparison to this story that you're going to tell me about from earlier on in Tanakh. David, have you got any sound yet? No, you haven't. OK, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Somebody wants to silence you. It isn't me. I've made my efforts to try and hear what you've got to say. OK, any questions or comments, anyone, before we go? Okay. Tell us about a million tonight, Johnny, please. Yes, there's 